Hey, what's up guys? This is Kelly Monahan, graduate teaching assistant in the Department of Criminal Justice here at UW. And this is the first audio lecture for 4140-80, the outreach section of criminal legal procedure. And the first thing I want to mention is that by the time you're listening to this, we've already had our first audio teleconferencing course, our discussion. And I'm actually recording this though on Saturday, January 24th, the weekend preceding our first uh, class. So what you're about to hear may be repeated, uh, what I've already mentioned uh, on Monday, but bear with me. I apologize, but take some comfort in the fact that if I'm repeating it, it's probably pretty important. It should be in your notes. It should be things that you're constantly thinking about, so maybe this will serve as a nice reminder. And I am already positive that I've mentioned this concept of the yin and yang. And this is particularly important when we think about the Fourth Amendment, because the Fourth Amendment is kind of drawn it's kind of that curved line drawn between the two halves of the yin and yang. And as far as the Fourth Amendment and as far as this course is concerned, those two halves are on one hand sort of the freedom uh, from unreasonable searches and seizures, the knowledge that we're comfortable and we're safe in our houses from police authority. And on the other side, it's police need discretion to protect us from crime and terrorism. And in order to do their jobs, they actually have to curtail our freedom. You know, but where we draw that line is a difficult task that's tackled by the court using the Fourth Amendment. And what we'll find, and actually if you could turn to page 1148, that's where, you're, that's where you'll find the language of the Fourth Amendment. And that's useful. You should be going back to page 1148. You should dog ear it. You should mark it. Uh, because you need to keep coming back to that language. And the Fourth Amendment, like I said, is pretty vague. It just says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable. And there's your key word there, unreasonable. Circle that. Unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrant shall be issued but upon probable cause or PC, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons, to be, uh, persons or things to be seized. Now, that sounds well and good, you know, but it still sounds vague. And this course is going to introduce circumstances like, for instance, if I'm driving down I-80 and I get pulled over for speeding and the highway patrolman comes up to my window, says, hey, what's up? And before he takes my license or asks me any questions, he sees a bag of pot on the passenger uh, seat, for instance. Now, you know, wham, bam, he's got probable cause at that point. And he can arrest me because I'm breaking the law. I've got a controlled substance and it's his training has led him to believe that that is in fact pot but you know what about my iPhone can he take the iPhone out of my front pocket and look through it because he's arrested me you know what about what's in my trunk a can he open my trunk and B if he finds for instance a backpack can he flip through that backpack you know these are things that most people don't know and the majority of people don't know but these are the kind of situations that this course is going to explore and there will be things that you know there will be you know they're the things that you're going to learn throughout the course and it's pretty darn interesting and this body of law is constantly changing it's constant constantly being manipulated like can you imagine that the founding fathers who drafted the constitution could ever foresee an instance where we've got a computer in our front pocket that could harbor incriminating evidence. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that makes this interesting because what we have is the language of the Fourth Amendment. And it's, like I said, the court's job to take that language and apply it to, you know, evolving society. And that's obviously pretty difficult. And with that, I need to mention at the outset, and I'm sure I've mentioned this uh, Monday, but these cases, we're going to be reading Supreme Court cases dealing with problems like these, and the reading is very difficult. Uh, these are densely written Supreme Court cases, and they demand your utmost attention, they demand your time, and they demand a lot of thought. So when you're reading these things, you need to realize that you might need to be rereading them, and you need to be uh, underlining and highlighting and making questions in the, in the uh, margins. You need to be asking these questions week by week, and you're going to come up with great questions. And some of these questions, even I'm going to struggle with, and I've been focusing on this stuff for uh, a couple years now, and I, it's what I find really interesting and what I... You know, I've sort of dedicated you know, my career and certainly my time in law school too. So I'm going to do my best, but if I don't have an answer to your question, I'm going to get you an answer uh, in due time. But know that you're going to come up with questions that I may not have the answer to. And sometimes I will, but sometimes I won't. So I'm just sort of alerting you to that at the outset. So please read the cases. Spend time with the reading. If you don't, you're going to find yourself in trouble. You know, we're going to be moving at a pretty fast pace. And what we're trying to do here is to build a knowledge base week by week. We're going to start real broad, 
build that foundation and we're going to keep building and building and building and building until we get to cases like the scenario I've already brought up the you know driving and the iPhone in the pocket and the duffel bag in the trunk um, can they search my passenger what if I had a passenger in the back seat and a lot of people don't know you know the rights that passenger may have uh, if the driver is the one breaking the law so that I means these are the things that we're going to build toward so before we go over chapter one a criminal justice process overview I want to talk about the case briefs a little bit as you're all well aware you're gonna have a case brief due each week and it actually comes out to be a pretty uh, substantial part of your grade at the end of the semester I want you to know that a case brief is just that it, it's brief but these cases are really long you're not gonna get away with just a couple of sentences under the facts you know a few words in issue and holding and reasoning uh, they need to be pretty comprehensive for instance if I were to call on you one day and say you know hey uh, Kyle you know why don't you tell me what was going on in Kimmelby California you know your brief should be your lifeline there you should be able to pull out your brief and know exactly what's going on and read to me or just maybe know off the top of your head even better you know what the relevant facts were to that case and you'll see on the rubric if you pull up under modules case briefing assignment one you pull that up you'll have the rubric and we spent professor Burnett and I spent some time putting together this rubric and you'll see exactly where you can get your points if the correct citation that's worth a point so in the case of Kimmelby California that's 395 US 752 comma 89 uh, the s and the ct obviously refer to supreme court 2034 comma 23rd led that's legal edition second 685 in parentheses 1969 now that's a mouthful but just know that you need to have the correct citation and it's convenient because they're on the top of every case so you should just be copying the citation from the from the top of the case and that's how you get your first point facts uh, what I'm going to say about the facts and again I've got this rubric here and I don't want to waste a lot of your time a lot of this uh, time out of the audio lecture but just the relevant facts you know what went down you know I don't need to know the caliber of the gun I don't need to know you know the brand of uh, you know gun or the make of the gun that was used I don't, I don't need to know any of that I need to know the the relevant clearly stated facts parties nature of the case um, nothing tangential anyway judicial history moving on half a point for ju judicial history and like it says in the rubric it's just a procedural history of the case now these cases get to the Supreme Court somehow just tell me how and you'll get um, half a point if you have any questions again email me uh, issue issues very important two points um, the issue a lot of times the court will say the issue upon appeal is whether or not blah 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 um, sometimes the court will say the question that we're deciding is this you know those are obviously your uh, how you get tipped off to what the exact issue is and what the actual uh, holdings gonna be you know the holding is the rule of law that the court arrives at holding should be pretty easy to spot and cases can't have more than one holding so be aware the case that you're assigned one week you know may hold three different things it may come up with three new black letter law rules uh, reasoning is the most important it's what I'm gonna spend the most time uh, grading and making sure that you understand how the issue arrived before the court and how the court got to its holding uh, most of these cases are reasoning they are reasoning section and you'll see that in the rubric that's worth five points it's sort of the sort of the meat and potatoes of how the court has arrived at its decision if you have any questions again email me reasoning is the most important other opinions uh, this is really important guys uh, when you start when I say for instance when I read a case uh, in really any class but especially in you know cases or excuse me courses that primarily look at the that look at uh, Supreme Court opinions the first thing I do with before even reading the case is I flip to the end and see um, who's concurring or if anyone is concurring and if so whom uh, who's dissenting if there's a dissent uh, who is joining the dissents how many dissents are there you know that's really important you'll notice that a lot of these cases are 5-4 and if you don't know what a 5-4 opinion is you you will shortly but it just means that the majority uh, decision only had five out of nine there's nine Supreme Court justices and it means that these are the kind of issues that are obviously very close calls you know one justice swinging to the other side completely changes the rule of law moving forward and just off the top of your head I'm sure you can think of cases in the news lately you know that have been five four some of the most uh, sort of pressing and most important in the frankly the most highly politicized cases are what we call five fours so you will notice that mo most of these cases are five fours and that's really important and if you get a 9-0 opinion on the other end you know that hey this this rule will probably never change at some point a court had a unanimous decision you know this is you know pretty pretty set in stone so 
when it comes to other opinions, know that it's very important to uh, to note who was you know who was concurring, who was dissenting, you know how many thought this way, you know how close was this rule to being a totally different rule. You know, at the end of the day, I just expect quality work. Uh, I expect you to put some time into these briefs. You only have one. You know, really, if you want to do well in this course, you should brief every case. You know, it's what we do in law school, and I don't expect you to do that. Uh, I, I'm not going to hold you to the same caliber as uh, law students. Um, that's not fair. It's actually kind of cruel. But I'm not going to. I'm, I'm not going to ask you to do that. But if you wanted to brief every case, I promise you'd be really set yourself up well for the three exams and to really understand this material. So anyway, I expect quality work. Don't rush it. Spend some time with it. And uh, if you show me that you did a, you know, a fairly good job of understanding and reading and rereading and put some time into putting the reasoning and the holding, maybe even your own words, uh, you're going to do just fine. If you have any questions, again, for the third time, shoot me an email. Okay, so now let's let's look at chapter one. And basically what I'd like you to do is if you've already read this, great. Um, if not, then maybe you can get away with uh, maybe skimming certain sections and paying closer attention to other sections. Um, but this is pretty important stuff, and I'm going to kind of walk you through some of the, what I find is most important, especially as it pertains to the material that we're going to cover, and just generally some stuff that's important when you study criminal law and especially criminal procedure and some criminal adjudication like we'll get into in this course. Now, on page one, chapter one, a criminal justice process overview, now the first section is the lawmaking structure. And uh, that first sentence, under the United States' version of federalism, each of the 50 state governments retains authority to enact its own criminal code. And federalism is the word that you need to pull out of that section. Now federalism is that constant tension between federal law and state law. And that used to be a really incredibly uh, tense area, especially when our country was in, you know, in, in its very uh, infant stages. And in the criminal law, state, state law pretty much rules. Um, like, like it goes on to later say, uh, roughly 96% of all prosecutions charging major offenses, i.e. felonies, are in state court. So for the most part, if I were to tonight, uh, on my way home, burn down a city block, I cause damage, and you know, let's say I you know, kill some people, I'm probably going to end up in state court because there are state laws, you know, each state is going to define arson a certain way, and, and obviously I have some murder charges there even. Uh, but that's not to say that federal law doesn't touch this too. If may, maybe if I burn down a bank, I'll be indicted in federal court. You just need to know that the overarching scheme has federal law touching all 50 states, but each state also has its own criminal code. And a lot of it is uh, derived from the model penal code, a lot of it is borrowed from other states, but you, al you always have those two kind of bodies of law floating. Uh, no matter which state you're in, you've got federal law to think about, too. And that sort of idea of federalism is at play. And maybe in the news lately, you've been paying attention to, uh, for instance, Ferguson, Missouri. You'll know that uh, that police officer, Darren Wilson, uh, was, was uh, the grand jury passed. And then there was the question of may maybe the feds will indict. So just know that just because a, a state doesn't indict you or file an information doesn't mean that you're necessarily off the hook in federal court, even though normally the feds will leave you alone. But anyway, moving on. You know, the next section that I really want you to pay attention to is section three here in that, on page three, the unifying role of federal constitutional regulation. If you haven't read that yet, why don't you hit pause, read it, and then hit play. Now we're going to uh, talk about incorporation uh, in chapter two, but I want to read this part to you because it's really important. As discussed in Chapter 2, these provisions originally applied only to the federal criminal justice processes. So that means that those really great things that are guaranteed to us in the Bill of Rights didn't necessarily apply to the states. And now we're kind of coming back to this federalism concern. Um, you know, do we li do as we drafting as we're drafting the Constitution, as we're kind of developing the United States, do we let the states handle these things? There's a lot of reasons why we shouldn't, and we're going to see that in uh, maybe Palvey, Alabama. I'll talk about Palvey, Alabama, and Brown, Mississippi. But basically, you know, certain things that were guaranteed by the, let's say, the Fourth Amendment, for instance, they weren't finding themselves in, you know, being enacted by states like Alabama and Louisiana. And we'll see that in Duncan, Louisiana, next. But you just need to know that the Fourteenth Amendment is what incorporated the Bill of Rights to the states. So 
you as a Wyoming citizen or a Utah citizen or a Idaho citizen, you have the guarantees incorporated by that uh, by the 14th Amendment. And if this sounds confusing or if I'm not being specific enough, trust me, we'll go into more detail later. Just read that section and know that it's, it's really important for this class. Now the next section I want to highlight is that first full paragraph in section 4 is talking about how the Constitution imposes no more than a baseline standard. Uh, the book goes on, it prescribes procedural prerequisites that each jurisdiction must meet as a minimum, but the jurisdictions remain free to prescribe additional procedural protections if they so desire. You know, now this makes sense. Now Wyoming can't give you less protection in their equivalent of the Fourth Amendment than the Constitution gives. You know, that would be violative of your constitutional rights that have been incorporated through the 14th Amendment granted to you by the Fourth Amendment. Um, but you can actually find that a lot of states will give you more protection, and Wyoming is a good example of that. Now, I've already read to you the Fourth Amendment in the U.S. Constitution, but I'm now going to read to you Article 1, Section 4 of the Wyoming Constitution, uh, which is titled Security Against Search and, Search and Seizure. Our Wyoming Constitution states that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. Okay, so we're almost exactly the word of the Fourth Amendment, but here's where it gets a little different. And no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by affidavit, particularly describing the place to be searched or the person or thing to be seized. Now, it may not seem that important, but the language supported by affidavit means that we've actually got to write things down. A cop, or excuse me, a police officer uh, has to actually write down what's going on. A judge needs to be able to see it and write it down. You can't just call in on the telephone and say, hey, Judge Monahan, this is what's going on. Can you issue me a warrant over the phone uh, to search this house? Nope. In Wyoming, you need that affidavit. So that's an example, briefly, of how a state can actually grant you more protection than the Constitution. And that's important to know moving on. Moving to section two, the administrative structure. Now, I want you to read through this, but you really don't need to take detailed notes or really worry about this uh, for the final. Uh, but what I want to, as I move forward this, I'm just going to flip through, and, and I've taken some notes. I want to bring some things to your attention. Uh, they talk about administrative diversity. Read through that. Um, it'll give you a good background. And then we start talking about police agencies. And what I want you to make sure to uh, take to mind here is that of course we've got three branches of government working all the time the legislative the judicial and the executive but when it comes to criminal procedure um, there's a you got the police agency obviously a, an executive branch of government working but what's also in ex the executive branch working is the prosecutor and the police and the prosecutor kind of work hand in hand so as you read this section just kind of be aware that the executive is the executive is really what's either you know locking you up or you know bringing charges and putting on evidence against you. Prosecutor and police again, same branch of government. Another thing to take to mind is that the executive department is very expansive and has a lot of money. Now, if the state brings arson charges against me, um, you know. I've got a lot of resources to overcome in my own defense and whereas the state or even possibly the feds has kind of a, a real deep pocket to prosecute me I'm kind of on my own when it comes to uh, the resources that's going to take to defend myself from the prosecutor from the state or from the feds so again just things to to think about moving forward the book also talks about officers having a great deal of uh, discretion. Now it says an arresting officer, for example, has the authority to search the pockets of the arrested per person. That's called search as an incident to arrest, and we'll talk about that. But it's also important to know that cops also have the discretion not to search incident to arrest. And so just know that the police have a broad deal of discretion, and for a thousand reasons that's a good thing, and then for uh, maybe even an equal number of reasons that can be problematic. And I don't have to venture too far back in time. Uh, things that are pretty noteworthy in the news to come up with examples of how discretion is both a good thing but it also can uh, maybe cause some trouble. Moving forward you'll see that the first sentence under prosecutors again you should read this read all read you know everything that we're going over here but I'm gonna skip over to prosecutors and that first sentence says that all state systems separate prosecution agencies from police agencies 
You know, that's not to suggest that they don't work in hand in hand. Obviously they do, and I've already talked about that. Prosecutors also have a great deal of discretion. They have the authority to refuse to proceed in a case presented by the police, and that power base may be util utilized to convince the police to discontinue practices that prosecutor views as contrary to the public interest. Now, even in my own very limited practice, uh, since I uh, have been in law school, a lot of times a prosecutor will have to tell certain police officers, hey, you know, you can't do this, I can't prosecute um, someone who's otherwise violating good laws if you do X, Y, and Z. And again, these are going to be the things that we're going to see come up in the cases. But it's, po it's important to know that kind of just that relationship between prosecutor and police force. It, it's so interesting, and uh, just pay, pay close attention to it. Now, I was planning on moving on to the next section, but I've got something highlighted here that I want to bring up. This last sentence, uh, that paragraph that continues on page 8, Police are not always interested in obtaining a prosecution, and they are aware that if they produce evidence adequate to gain a trial conviction or plea bargain as to a serious offender, the prosecutor will be under considerable pressure to go forward with the prosecution, even though the police did not proceed as the prosecutor would have preferred. Now, you know, I'm hitting pause and I'm kind of going, you know, kind of gaining some, you know, gathering my notes and uh, kind of wondering what I'm going to go through next and kind of getting that ready. But this reminds me of something that I actually hadn't noted. Uh, my professional responsibility professor here at uh, UW Law tells a story. He was a federal prosecutor in the state of North Dakota, and he developed a reputation of being really, really by the book. I guess his predecessor um, was less so, but this guy now teaches professional responsibility, so you can imagine how by the book uh, he is. But anyway, he got a lot of federal, uh, federal officers mad at him because they were doing great work and they were putting themselves in danger you know, investigating these crimes, and they would bring things to him, and he would go go through them with uh, a fine-tooth comb, and he f if he found anything that could jeopardize the conviction, uh, talking about uh, violating the Fourth Amendment of a uh, someone criminally accused, he would throw it out. And there was incredible tension between him, uh, the judges, and uh, especially the, co uh, the federal officers. So, Again, I've already said this, and I'm, I, again, I apologize for being repetitive, but know that there's a, just an incredibly interesting relationship between prosecutors and sort of the police that are working alongside them. Um, obviously, you have people like Professor Easton who, who are really, really by the book, but we'll see in other instances that some prosecutors will be, I guess, less willing to really stick toward the uh, bedrock principles, and uh, uh, maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing, because on the other I'm trying to be bipartisan, but on the other end of that, you've got people who are obviously committing crimes, but they still have those constitutional guarantees. So these are those things that are highly politicized, and I can't wait to get your opinion on them. I can't wait to get discussion about them. But I'm going to quit belaboring the point and move on. So next, go ahead and read that defense counsel section. And uh, I'm going to put my cards on the table, and I'm going to let you know that my work personally has been in criminal defense. Uh, I've worked with a lot of prosecutors, but for the most part, I've been on the other end with the you know quote unquote bad guys, and I really do enjoy the work. And what the book brings up about defense counsel is pretty bare bones, but it's good information. You need to know, and I'm sure you already know, that in the United States now, if you can't afford an attorney and you've been uh, charged with a felony, one will be appointed to you, and those in Wyoming at least are called public defenders. Now I've never worked in a public defender office, but I know a lot of good public defenders, and these are things that if you want to talk to me further about, email me or give me a call. Um, but all I'm going to say is maybe just reiterate what the book brings up. Um, that defense counsel in criminal cases may be privately retained or counsel provided by the state for indigent defendants. Now, we'll talk about Gideon v. Wainwright. I'm not even sure if it's um, a case that's assigned. I don't think it is, but we'll still talk about it a little bit. You know, that was the case that guaranteed uh, counsel be appointed to you if you're uh, facing, a felony, fel facing a felony charge. And the system really doesn't work. Uh, unless both sides have quality counsel, and uh, I don't, I can point to a lot of statistics. I can point to a lot of instances that show the system kind of crumbling when you don't have a good lawyer on each side. You know, everyone. I hope that I can impart at least this: is that you know, everyone charged deserves an attorney. They deserve their fair day in court, and that's what's guaranteed by the Constitution, specifically the Sixth Amendment, which we'll talk less about than the Fourth. But my practice. Uh, was in private counsel. Now, we were the ones who were actually paid by people criminally charged, and I'd love to share some of this. I probably will share some of this. I might even bring in um, some, some attorneys 
and maybe they'll join lecture and they'll have some insight when we get to kind of those kind of cases. But anyway, moving forward. Okay, moving on, page 10. It's important to read this section about judges. Now, coming into law school, I really didn't know the judicial structure and how expansive it was. I couldn't have told you the difference between a magistrate or a trial court judge. You know, but this section does a great job, and I'm not going to repeat it, but it does a great job of kind of letting you know what magistrates do, what trial judges do. Um, when we move forward, if you want to know exactly how Wyoming is structured, structured um, I'd be more than happy to kind of talk about that during our time each week. But for the most part, know that the judges are the ones who sign off on arrest warrants and search warrants. Um, I already talked about that supported by affidavit uh, section in the Wyoming Constitution versus the um, supported by oath or affirmation in the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. You know, but the judges are the ones as kind of the gatekeepers saying, no, officer, I don't see probable cause here. You cannot seize Kelly Monahan versus, oh, yeah, Kelly's you know, guilty of sin. I'm going to sign off on that search warrant. Go get him. Okay, that's really, I, I want you to just read through these, read about the felony trial courts, read about the magistrate courts, um, and kind of develop, again, a familiarity with that. Section 3 is titled, The Steps in the Process, and I'm really going to fly through this, because if we were going to read the whole book, that would cover, you know, what most institutions would call Criminal Procedure 1 and Criminal Procedure 2, or Criminal Procedure 1 and then Criminal Adjudication. You know, we're talking about procedure, and procedure is really limited to what goes down on the street versus what happens like on appeal or even at the trial and discovery stages. So why don't you read through the whole thing because it's important, but you have my uh, permission to skim this first section, skim the step one pre-arrest investigation all the way to prosecutorial investigations because I'm going to stop there, I'm going to pause there, and I'm going to gather some notes and talk about that a bit. Uh, pay really close attention to prosecutorial investigation and especially close attention to step two arrest. So I would really like you to read those sections before you listen to um, the rest of this audio. Okay, so when we talk about prosecutorial investigations, we're talking about investigations that aren't being done by the police. And I think that's maybe the first sentence of that section. And what's synonymous with prosecutorial investigations is the grand jury. Now, again, it's almost impossible to talk about the grand jury in early 2015 without talking about Ferguson and Eric Garner and that kind of thing, because all politics and all opinions aside, it's a really good example of how grand juries operate. And this isn't necessarily pertinent to exactly what we're going over this course, but I think it's worthy of maybe one or two brief minutes. Basically, what separates um, sort of the power of the prosecutorial investigation, again, the grand jury is, like the reading says, a subpoena power. Now, a prosecutor in a grand jury can subpoena really anyone, and then you are sort of mandated, not sort of mandated, you are mandated to appear and present evidence to the grand jury, and then they're the ones who decide whether or not there's probable cause. They're the ones who decide whether or not an indictment follows. Now, again, I, I'm sorry if this sounds maybe patronizing or I'm telling you stuff that you already know, but this is stuff that a lot of my classmates and I didn't know coming into school. Maybe we were just naive, but um, I really want to maybe kind of push this because the prosecutor has a lot of power in grand jury proceedings, and it's just important to know how they operate. And again, the authors of this book do an excellent job of keeping it both informative and brief, but just understand that the subpoena power is so so powerful and the prosecutor has a lot of discretion on what goes on in the grand jury the defendants not there the defendants counsel not there the judge isn't even there the prosecutor kind of dumps all the information and then you know we the the grand jury the people who are um, hailed into court get to decide whether or not there's probable cause and we're the ones kind of in charge of whether or not a trial is going to follow also worth mentioning that if a grand jury fails to indict, a prosecutor can go out and get another grand jury. There's no limit to one. And that's kind of interesting, and it's something that I don't think a lot of people uh, realize. So anyway, this is something I'd like to talk about further, but it's not pertinent to this course. So I'm going to move on to step two, arrest. So please read that entire section. It's probably the most important step as uh, related to this class. Go ahead and hit play once you've read that section. Okay, when it comes to the arrest, it's important to recognize a few things, and they're, br they're mentioned in the reading, so I'm going to keep this brief. So once you are arrested, police have a right to search you, and that's called a search incident to arrest. And how expansive that search is, 
Um, we'll see. And Kim will be California talks to how kind of expansive that search can be, what can be searched, and what can't be searched. And this kind of brings into uh, the conversation whether or not like your phone or your wallet or anything else in your car. You know, these are all things that we'll uh, talk about when we talk about search incident to arrest in that section of cases. Uh, but one thing I want to really bring out is that paragraph that starts, I think it's the first, second, third paragraph of that section starts with secondly. And I'm going to read that sentence. Secondly, the police may, excuse me, yeah, may have the option of making the arrest with or without an arrest warrant, which is a court order authorizing the police to arrest a particular person. You know, that's a really important distinction because uh, I think there might be a lot of misconception floating around that, that arrest warrants are maybe superfluous or unnecessary because police, when they see something illegal, they can just kind of barge in and make arrests. Well, that's true, but there's two overriding sort of concepts that are floating around when police don't have an arrest warrant, and that's probable cause. We'll talk about the development of probable cause, which is actually in the Fourth Amendment itself, and then this development of reasonable suspicion, and I'm sure you've heard this term, maybe you even know the case that it flowed from, and that's Terry v. Ohio. We spent a lot of time talking about uh, Terry v. Ohio. But just know that a judge can authorize an arrest. A judge can sign off and say, yes, go get Kelly Monahan, that terrible criminal. He's done all kinds of terrible things, and a probable cause has been established. You know, go get him. Or a cop, obviously, in the course of his duty, his or her, her duty, excuse me, um, can see something suspicious or and develop probable cause and make an arrest on his or her own. Again, as the book highlights, when the choice is available, the clearly dominant practice in all jurisdictions is to proceed without first entertaining a, an arrest warrant. And for a million practical purposes, that makes a lot of sense. It's not as if a cop is going to see me um, maybe open fire into a bar or a restaurant and say, uh-oh, you know, I better go down to Judge Donnell's office and get an arrest warrant first. Obviously, that doesn't make sense. That's ridiculous. So the predominant practice, obviously, is a, a police officer obtaining probable cause and making an arrest. Okay, guys, it's been 32 minutes. I've wasted 32 minutes of your time. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about the rest of the steps. Instead, I'm going to hope that you read and actually you know, pay some attention, maybe take some notes to the remaining pages. I think it's 18 to 28 that we're not going to talk about because I'm already 32 minutes in. Uh, I've talked enough. You're probably already sick of my voice, and you're thinking, man, i got another 14 weeks of this, so I apologize. Just know that this, this, the rest of this stuff is important, but it doesn't necessarily uh, go into what we're going to really be covering in this class. Maybe some pretrial motion stuff, um, preliminary hearing maybe, grand jury review maybe. Just know that as far as maybe page 25, step 12, pretrial motion, the motion that we're talking about most often in this course is the motion to suppress, which is you know, the suppression of evidence that was illegally obtained because it was violative of my Fourth Amendment rights. Um, so we're going to talk about that in great detail, and I'm going to venture to guess that most of you already know quite a bit about motions to suppress and the Fourth Amendment, and a lot of what I've talked about this afternoon, this evening, this morning, whenever you're listening to this, is a review, and that's kind of what I'm hoping. So anyway, guys, I look forward to next week. I look forward to your first batch of case briefs. I'm going to try to be good about grading those quickly, providing a lot of helpful feedback. Please know that I'm available. Call me on my office. I even have my cell phone listed. Um, as a last resort, um, if you really need to talk to me, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to call my cell phone. Just let me know who you are because <laughs> I won't have your number, obviously. I'll say who's, you know, who, who's calling me right now. Um, but I'm eager to help. I'm really excited about this semester and uh, look forward to speaking with you all soon. Thanks for listening.